Picture this. You're not just fixing cars. You're living your passion every day. At Cox, you'll work on a diverse range of automobiles. Surrounded by a team of friendly, like-minded individuals, you'll enjoy great pay and benefits. Ready to make this a reality? At Cox, we're recruiting auto and diesel techs to join our Mannheim and Fleet Services teams. Learn, grow, and fine-tune your career as a technician at Cox. Find out more at cox.career slash autotech. When you need mealtime inspiration, it's worth shopping Kroger, where you'll find over 30,000 mouth-watering choices that excite your inner foodie. And no matter what tasty choice you make, you'll enjoy our everyday low prices, plus extra ways to save, like digital coupons worth over $600 each week. You can also save up to $1 off per gallon at the pump with fuel points. More savings and more inspiring flavors make shopping Kroger worth it every time. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Fuel restrictions apply. With your host, Andrew Donaldson, this is Heard Tell. Uh, welcome back to Herd Tell. Okay, friend of the program, been on here before. He's down at the Pulaski Institute down in our Kansas place. I know pretty well from having had to live there for a spell. Alan Elrod, how are you, sir? I'm doing well. Glad to be back. Great to see you, sir. He's also writing at Arc Digital. That's where this particular piece is, but he's written many, many other places. Sharp guy. I want to tee this up this way because here we go again. This is another story where a whole lot of culture and political and economic and social and you pick any one of the things that folks study and pontificate on. Those things are going to cross streams on this topic because we're talking about families. Mm. I actually want to work backwards on your piece. We're going to link to it. Go to the Substack notes or digital read the whole piece. I actually want to stop back, start backwards with one of the last things you said, because I think this statement frames this entire debate, whether you're talking about families, societies, families, the building block is society. Well, everybody agrees on that, but what do you consider family? What do you don't? Hmm. You wrote it this way, and I think this is good framing. More fundamentally, family can take a great variety of shapes and forms as can community writ large. This is the key. Life is contingent. And when we drown that contingency in black and white thinking and reactionary attitudes, we harm our ability to think richly about the kind of world we want people to grow up in. I think that framing is perfect to get into this thing about families and adoptions and life and all this culture stuff. Life's contingent, man. You can't put it in a one word sentence or a buzzword or even multiple tomes of books. This is a big, big idea and a small phrase that you phrase that we really need to get into. Um, yeah, you know, the, 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 reason I wanted to focus there at the end is I think, you know, this piece is, is uh, in many ways, particularly not obviously when I'm talking about someone like Marjorie Taylor Greene, but when I'm dealing with things like anti-adoption advocacy, I'm not taking on people that I think have um, bad intentions. And, and frankly, I'm not uh, in disagreement with plenty of the criticisms. What matters to me, and, and this is something that I think it's lost uh, and, and on all sides of the political spectrum, but sometimes in different ways, is the the way in which we don't want to buy into, I think, deterministic narratives about uh, the way the world works. It's very healthy and important to point out systemic challenges and systemic injustices. And similarly, you know, um, there are real issues when it comes to, you know, the genetic challenges with adoption, particularly things like access to medical history. But, uh, and we'll get into all that, I assume. But the core idea to me is that, uh, you know, ultimately, people's environments are pretty variable. Lots of different things come together to make, uh, you know, family, to make a person's life story. Uh, lots of people choose very different combinations, right, of relationships and 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 um, ways to live. And and you know, I'm typically pretty wary when we get into conversations on, especially frankly, when it's meant to be uh, justice-oriented conversations, and we lose sight of 
that contingency. We lose sight of one, the individual, and two, the the just the contingent nature of life and of of human beings when they get together in groups because there's a lot of variability. Uh, there's a lot of variability to what can happen. There's a lot of variability to the meaning we make out of things. Uh, and I guess you're going to get into all that. But yeah, that's the core idea of that sentiment that I expressed at the end. And I do hope it carries through in, in the other parts of the piece. It does. And I think something that's been happening, I've been noticing this online a lot. I'm chronically online. I openly admit it. I've noticing this a bunch lately, folks. And, and I know it's coming from the political Look, once we did the Dobbs decision, those folks aren't going to stop fighting that battle. They're going to go to the next thing. Both mm -hmm. sides. There's been this group of folks on the right that have now gone to adoptions, in vitro fertilizations, you know, various forms of people wanting to start a family that don't just naturally start a family for whatever reason, medical, whatever. This is throughout politics and culture and online. You take something universally agreed upon. Everybody agrees that family is a good thing. Family is a healthy thing. Family is good for society. Nobody really debates that. But then you have these unworthy schemers and the bad faith folks. They latch onto that good thing and start trying to weave in some really bad extremism underneath the guise of, well, of course you're for family values, right? We've been hearing that. Look, I grew up in the, the 90s. I'm family values, family values, family but you can get a lot of bad stuff under family values. And it's the same thing now with some of the life stuff and the family stuff and adoption and in vitro and some other things you're focusing on adoption here. You get bad faith actors. They use that overlying umbrella and then they try to sneak in into the dry spots to start spreading some really bad stuff. Yeah. Um, so I, I think I probably want to uh, compartmentalize my answer here to a couple different areas, which is, one, um, I very much object, you know, I'm adopted and I mentioned that in the piece, uh, uh, to adoption being used as a uh, sort of, as a pro-life um, piece of leverage, right? Uh, I am, you know, I have a very happy life, but the idea that um, adoption should just sort of be politically leveraged as a way to say abortion should never occur, I think is very insensitive. It's, it's wrong. Uh, you know, women should be able to make that choice. Uh, and, and, and so, you know, and I, I don't care for when people reference my own adoption history to suggest that uh, I am somehow a living example of the fact that, that um, abortion is a bad choice. I don't think that, right? Uh, it, existentially, it's, it's impossible for me to think that, right? Because I just wouldn't be here. <laughs> and, and so that's like, uh, you know, those are the kind of paradoxical things where when people ask you that, uh, well, what if you weren't here? Well, then I wouldn't be here. Uh, so I couldn't, I can't contemplate that reality. Um, but uh, on the other side of this, I think, you know, and if we get into to some of the specific objections raised um, by anti-adoption advocates, this is where I think it's really important to pick at um, how a line of thinking can be dangerous, even if it's being um, put forward in good faith, right? Because I don't actually believe a lot of these arguments are being made on that side in bad faith. What I think is, and this is where it gets sticky, I am really not interested in suggesting that people operating, in, particularly adoptees operating in the anti-adoption space are sort of one-to-one -one similar to someone like Marjorie Taylor Greene. They're not. But this is something that worries me sometimes in, in frankly, in justice spaces, in, in, in uh, anti-racist spaces, as well as in um, these conversations that I'm obviously more personally close to around adoption, which is when we buy in on the front end to a particular kind of logic around genes and DNA and biology in terms of who, who you are, what, what it determines about your nature, what it determines about the people you can and can't relate to. There are some, I think, incredibly dangerous uh, ideas buried there from the outset that even if the goal is not to care for, and look, plenty of people argue against adoption without ever really getting into the the weeds of biological essentialism. They focus on the economic injustices that lead women who may not want to give up their children uh, the, to give them up, they focus on the way adoption has been used as a tool to dismember indigenous communities. And those are all true and fair criticisms. But, 
and this is what I try to focus on, when you accept at the beginning a particular set of ideas about biology and how it relates to human relationship, human nature, that I think are faulty, and not just faulty, have have political tales, right, that, that are inescapable, then you are setting yourself up for something that can get, I think, quite uh, pernicious. Picture this. You're not just fixing cars. You're living your passion every day. At Cox, you'll work on a diverse range of automobiles. Surrounded by a team of friendly, like-minded individuals, you'll enjoy great pay and benefits. Ready to make this a reality? At Cox, we're recruiting auto and diesel techs to join our Mannheim and Fleet Services teams. Learn, grow, and fine-tune your career as a technician at Cox. Find out more at cox.career slash autotech. When you need mealtime inspiration, it's worth shopping Kroger, where you'll find over 30,000 mouth-watering choices that excite your inner foodie. And no matter what tasty choice you make, you'll enjoy our everyday low prices, plus extra ways to save, like digital coupons worth over $600 each week. You can also save up to $1 off per gallon at the pump with fuel points. More savings and more inspiring flavors make shopping Kroger worth it every time. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Fuel restrictions apply. At Kroger Pharmacy, care is what's most convenient for you. Care is being here when you need us. We're open evenings and weekends. Care is helping you save more. Most insurance plans and discount cards are accepted at your local Kroger Pharmacy. Care is saving you time by managing your prescriptions online. You can request refills, check order status, and more. Care is convenience that works for everyone. Kroger Health. A world of care is in store. Services and availability vary by location. Age and other restrictions may apply. For coverage, consult your health insurance company. Visit the pharmacy or our site for details. Alan Alrod joining us. Part of the adoption part two is, and you touch on it over and over again in this piece. Let's go back to that contingent word because that's, <laughs> let's keep that thing going. Here's the problem. If you're going to talk about, okay, it can be a faulty system at times. Absolutely. It can. There's been injustices in the past and probably will be in the future. Absolutely. There can be. There's also some really bad alternatives. You can look up, a quick Google search on what the CPS system in America is like right now. It's not good, even in the best circumstances and in bad circumstances, it's horrific. Um, There's plenty of children out there that need cared for by loving homes. There's a lot of people that can't have children for whatever reason that would love to get them. So you can say the system's broken, but there's clearly two parties there in the abstract that have a need that would like to get together. Now, you can debate the ways of getting those two parties together, and I know we're simplifying it, but a complex problem, you got to simplify the core issue, right? Then that's where you get this overarching thing of all this other stuff. You touched on it over and over again, things like popularized popularized beliefs. You even go, you brought up Floyd, God bless you. I don't know if you were trying to win a bingo card or something. You bring up, you know, primitive trauma, all that. All this other stuff, though, is you have to stop for the alternatives like, there's people out there that want to love people and there's people out there that need to be loved and they want a family unit. And we still need to have that in some form or fashion. How's that getting lost in all this other stuff? Well, I think the way it gets lost, uh, I think there's a number of ways. One is, um, that the, the the concept of family, you know, you say, well, everybody agrees that family is important. Well, yes, but family's also always been a politicized concept as well, right? Because uh, it is integral in many ways. So um, there are a lot of political assumptions that come along with what is and isn't a good family, Um, right? And and so a lot of people on this anti-adoption side who would say they're making up what they would argue, I think, is a political justice argument that separating people in these kinds of conditions, that barring people from access to their uh, medical histories, to their records, And by the way, this is an example where the U.S. is an exception. And this is an example, I think, of where the arguments are very strong against how adoption is practiced in a lot of places in the United States. I was adopted through a closed adoption 
basically means no contact, no very limited access to your records. If I wanted to get access, I would have to go through a lengthy and probably expensive court process. Um, now, I don't object, as some people do, to the idea of having had my name changed on my birth certificate. There are some people in the anti-adoption community who argue this is a legal lie. That's where I think we start tipping back into biological debates. But um, the United States is much worse about these practices of limiting uh, adoptees' access to their histories and their records. And the possibility of recontact has to be there, I think. This is where we get into the question of, you know, you said there's these parties that need to come together. It's true. But, you know, um, as, a, as an infant, I can't possibly consent to never, ever having the ability to access all these records and information. Um, and that is a, a situation where we have to, I think, be very serious about uh, uh, reforming the adoption system. Now, when I talk about something like Marjorie Taylor Greene in the piece, I actually think, you know, she's not making a biological argument at all. She's basically, you know, she talks about fake moms and fake dads. Uh, uh, in terms of adoptive parents. But what she's really saying is, I don't agree with the way some people are raising their children. And that's a whole second conversation, right? That's a question about the fitness of parents that this isn't even really about the anti-adoption movement anymore. This is about people saying a person who is parenting their child in these sort of ways that I don't agree with, right? Which is to say for her, uh, instilling, you know, quote unquote, liberal or progressive values, right? Talking about, uh, these things that she doesn't agree with, that that delegitimizes them. Now, she chose to talk about adoptive parents because I think she thought it would be more uh, legitimate, right, to say, like, well, they're a fake parent, right, because they're teaching them these things. But that sentiment seems to be there all the way through, right? When we talk about parents' rights, you know, when groups like Moms for Liberty use, and this, this comes back to your original kind of question, when they use that fundamental idea of family to assert, I have a stake in what my child is learning in public schools, well, to a degree, but children are also part of the broader communities they live in. Children are also future. Children are also citizens. They are also future participants in communities. They are not uh, static, you know, objects to be controlled. And um, so, other people have a stake in educating kids, and other people's kids also attend these schools, right? So there's a kind of there's a kind of sleight of hand there where you're saying I deserve to have you know, these controls because I'm a parent and my, and I have a, I have a stake in this, but also to other parents. So do other people whose children may feel restricted by these changes. So do uh, people who are teachers in these schools who may not be able to talk openly about their families and relationships. So I, I'm trying to link together what are actually, I think, different problems, but where there are undercurrents of a certain degree of rigidity and essentialism and more than anything, a very, a very kind of restrictive way of talking about what is and isn't a family that ultimately, even if you are trying to start from a position, position of pursuing justice, um, that seed of a uh, uh, more rigid, I think, black and white thinking about the in and out of what is a proper family is a, a kind of poison pill. Yeah, Alan Elrod joining us. We have to go one step further with what you just said, though, and you touch on this repeatedly in the piece. Things like what Marjorie Taylor Greene and the Moms for Liberty is like, look, there's this age-old universal problem in learning where science and philosophy have this big gray area where they meet and nobody really knows where they meet, and the communication between the two is not good, and science doesn't talk to philosophy good, philosophy doesn't talk to science real well, and we're going to fight this forever as long as there's human beings, right? The problem is when you come to the thing like a family, they're both. You have a yeah. you have parents that are biological, but family can be biological and line up with that, but it can also have nothing to do with it at all. It's just the unit where folks love you. But then you mm -hmm. have these untowards actors, and we've seen it in history throughout other things. If you start trending to just the straight biology, there's a lot of tyranny and really bad, ugly human stuff there. If you trend to just the philosophy and completely discount all the science stuff, you also get into some really bad, ugly stuff in human, and we have human history to back all that up. So how do we navigate that murky water? Because that's even deeper than the adoption thing. But when you start talking about a family, it's just a really good example of that universal problem. Absolutely. So uh, one, I'm going to recommend a book here that I love, which is uh, Angela Saini, uh, last name S-A-I-N-I. -I. Uh, and 
uh, her most recent book is The Patriarchs, which is this wonderful history of, of how uh, uh, women came to be displaced in societies across human history. But the, the book I'm really going to talk about here is a book called Superior, uh, which is a, a great exploration of, of, can, of the sort of resurgence of race science that she talks about. And it shows up across the political spectrum, right? And, and this is where it gets really interesting. It's such a great history of the kind of ideas of biology, uh, talks about eugenics, but also talks about kind of like how even those of us who think of ourselves as very often enlightened on some of these issues are tempted to buy into the sort of notion that there are sort of, that race is sort of real in the sense that there are differences that need to be, uh, 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 you know, um, recognized scientifically and, and I think can tip into, right, as this book I think does a really good job of, of delineating, tip into really dangerous sort of pseudoscience places. And, and the other kind of recommendation I'd make is a great book called How to Be a Liberal by Ian Dunt, where he focuses a lot on the way uh, identity politics, uh, which in many ways has its roots in the pursuit of progressive ends, in defending marginalized groups, can if you subsume the individual in this, right? Because this is what's critical. If you subsume the individual in it completely and you say, uh, well, we're not actually interested in the fact that the goal of justice across marginalized groups starts with the idea that individual people are deserving of equal human dignity. And therefore, we need a politics that takes account for the great variety of contexts in which people live and make meaning and, and have uh, uh, pursued their lives. If it gets subsumed in a more kind of group mentality where we we concretize, whether through biology or through culture, where we concretize and reify uh, these groups as permanent and fixed uh, and having set boundaries, then we get into some really challenging places. And so, you know, my background is nationalism. And that's a lot of what, you know, the history of studying nationalism about is this taking very real histories and traditions, right? Languages, cultures, saying, but fixing them in a way that they become more rigid, where the boundaries become set. Uh, and where you start to dabble in a kind of um, pseudo history and pseudoscience, because invariably nothing in the story of humanity is that fixed, right? Which is very similar to many of the arguments Saini makes in the book about what we what what the what the actual evidence shows us about genes, which is they influence us but they're not a blueprint for how you're going to be as a person and they're not a per they, you know you're not set out on a roadmap from the beginning not by culture and not by genetics you know there's a lot of contingency in life Every day, we rise, challenging ourselves to work for what we believe in. At U.S. Border Patrol, protecting our borders is more than a job. It's a calling. Agents answer the call, working together to keep our country and communities safe. If you are ready for a new mission, join U.S. Border Patrol and go beyond. Learn more at cbp.gov careers. Alan Elrod joining us. You ran into this firsthand because of all places you wound up and found yourself on Dr. Phil. Um, <laughs> I want to approach it this way, though. You just mentioned it. There's these strands. Look, ethno-nationalism is not a new thing. There's mm -hmm. been studies like people can even say it's it's almost a natural default for certain sets of people to go to that because they go to things like race or gender or sex or whatever. This is a human problem. It's a soul problem, a heart problem. It's something science isn't going to solve. But when you start talking about families, 
on a practical level, when you hear certain buzzwords, it should flag it. And you heard those buzzwords when you did Dr. Phil. You start yeah. hearing things, you mentioned it in the piece, and this is stuff people listening to this conversation that you and I are having. You can see it in social media. You can hear it on podcasts. You can hear it in media. People say things like, well, of course, an adoptive parent can't love like a biological parent. That's a red flag to that sort of thinking. Well, of course, your blood is thicker than what? That's a red flag to that thinking. Of course, the phrase in and of itself, nothing wrong with it, but it's just it's one of those things where you perk up and go, okay, does that really mean... Give us a couple of those things because you heard them on that show with your panel. I heard them and they've been said to me since, since the piece came out. And you'll see them all through. Give folks a couple of those as the example. We'll link to that clip, by the way, on the Substack notes. Give people (laughs) a couple of those red flags to be looking for that they're starting to leave that area of honest questioning, honest discussion, and getting into those dark areas of, oh, this is going to go down a path where it's going to go to those same old problems we've seen in history that's really bad stuff. I think you have to be really willing to, to, to contemplate the, ex, the extension of an idea, right? What does it mean? And I'm not making a kind of like ad absurdum argument where you just take it so far silly willy. But like, let's say this. People will say, well, a lot of times I think what people who have good intentions mean when they think like, oh, they're not to parent can't love in the same way. Because the, there are like hormonal things that happen when a mother gives birth or like connections to the child that are meant to like, that are built into us that do things like um, help us form those attachments. And they're kind of evolutionary things. And um, there's, there's nothing I think wrong with saying the, there are some, some differences in the process through which an adoptive parent bonds with their child. However, consider the implication. The implication of that is that genetic proximity is the most important thing for being able to form a te- not just attachments, but being able to feel those kinds of levels of compassion um, and commitment to another person. Well, that's actually, even though I know that people are not, who, who maybe are coming to this from a justice perspective. Now, I think Anton probably is not going to get this from a justice perspective, uh, who, who Anton was on the show. Um, and by the way, no one knew on the show that I was adopted other than uh, Britt, who was another panelist, because we talked about it off stage beforehand, but no one else was aware of that. Um, and I didn't bring it up. Um, but when you say those things, prox- genetic proximity is somehow important to these relational aspects. Well, actually, you know what? That's the argument a lot of ethno nationalists make, right? Is that the reason why the nation has to be kept kind of coherent in this way is because these, these bonds that make us a community. Uh, are are sort of mystical and primordial and they're linked. And then when science came along, right, and made very real helpful revelations about human DNA and genes, some people ran with that back to that kind of old, and they linked it back to that old kind of mystical logic of, well, you need to be in your kind of pool of people. So I think you have to contemplate, you know, what are the what are the actual big assumptions about the statement I'm making and what happens when I carry those into other contexts, right? Do they actually lead me to risky or even perhaps unpalatable conclusions that I wouldn't be comfortable with, right? And I think that's that's the kind of challenge stepping back. I wanted to really try in this piece to not attack individuals. Now, granted, I have very little interest in defending the, the virtue of something like Marjorie Taylor Greene or Jesse Lee Peterson or Anton, but I wanted to show there are people who can advance an argument with good intentions where you still have to step back and say, what happens when this line of thinking is dropped into another context? What happens when I try to show you what arguments around the idea that sort of genetic proximity is 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 really important to these other aspects of human relationship, and I carry it into some other political realm. Well, it gets really unnerving, right? And if it unnerves you, then we maybe we should be cautious about where that thinking takes us. Alan Andrade joining us. I want to finish up where we started with life is contingent. There's a lot of ins and outs to this stuff. Practical policy-wise, this is an online debate, but most people are going to recoil if you start trying to limit adoptions and things like this. They, they're going to have a natural reaction to that because most people think adoptions is good Mm -hmm. but there is some policy things where these things do need to be 
well regulated. They need to be what we already talked about how CPS is a mess and, or whatever it's called where you are. That system's a mess in a lot of ways. And those are some of the people that's supposed to be overwatching some of this stuff. What's some practical policy stuff we need to work on? I know you talked about open adoptions as opposed to closed adoptions or at least some version thereof where folks can get some kind of a medical history or something. But there's there's other things, too. Is it more public private partnerships and adoptions? Is it reforming the adoption agencies in the private sector? Is it the, the way the government approaches it? Give folks a couple of things policy wise. It's on the horizon. They need to be watching out for here. Uh, so I would send people one to a place called Adopt Match. They do great work on on informing people about this. Look, a, a dream scenario for me, every single state should impose uh, laws that make closed adoption the absolute last, if not uh, a complete impossible option. That is, to me, clearly not just. It is not okay to to create a situation where people who are adopted do not at some point have access to other aspects of their their medical history, their records, et cetera. Recontact should be the choice of individuals, right? There should not be a legal system imposed that makes that impossible. Uh, and it should also be understood that even if a birth parent thinks they don't want recontact in the moment of separation, they might later. And, and so closed adoption to me is just fundamentally uh, not good. Uh, and, and there are just, the problem is that in the United States, one, it's still kind of the norm in a lot of places. Two, um, even you know, even places where open open adoption is being practiced, there are a lot of U.S. states where there's not really a legal framework that enforces uh, open adoption agreements. It says you actually have to honor them, makes it easy. And look, there are other. This is an example where the United States is absolutely an exception in a bad way, right? There are other countries like the UK where you turn 18 and you get access to records. There are, um, this is not exactly how everyone is doing it. And that's the other thing. Adoption is a wonderful thing, in my opinion. But it's, it's we have absolutely got to treat everyone involved as a person who is uh, uh, worthy of dignity and full rights and respect. And as people living contingent lives where there may in fact be a desire at some point for reconnection. There may be, uh, the, the, even the concept of family can shift. Some people are not adopted into wonderful situations and some people are, right? That's the other truth. Not everyone's adoption story is a fairy tale uh, and uh, people deserve to be able to live their lives as full individuals with all the same access. And you know that includes things like Transnational adoptees should be granted citizenship, right? That is done in other countries. It should be done here. It's absurd to say this person has been brought into a family and the United States government will recognize their parents as their parents, but it won't recognize those parents' children as citizens of the same country. That's crazy. So we absolutely have to reform the system in a lot of ways. Um, and also, you know, listen to people who are adopted, you know, I, 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 and, and don't, don't assume that every person who's been adopted has the same uh, level of comfort with that experience or has a positive experience. Or, you know, if they're not happy they were adopted, that is a legitimate feeling for that person to have. Now, I try to contend with the arguments that sometimes come from that sense of confusion or anger or angst that I think are problematic, that I think take you down dangerous paths. But I don't dismiss the idea that there are plenty of people who are legitimately uh, not pleased with that experience. So the idea is we just need to have a system that recognizes contingency, that respects the dignity of individuals, that treats people like individuals uh, with full rights. And, and I think that's the best starting place. Yeah, Alan Elrod, the piece is called Blood and Foils. That's a great line, by the way. Adoption, <laughs> biology, and the need to combat essentialism wherever we are, how these arguments are coming from uh nativism and extremism it's in arc digital great publication i've published that before a couple times we're going to link to the whole piece but alan let folks know where they can keep up with you where they can find you and where they can read your stuff and follow you until we get you back on her tell again my friend absolutely um you can go to uh pulaski institution Dot org. I am the presidency of the Pulaski Institution. We're around also on some socials. I myself am at A.S. Elrod on Twitter and on threads uh, and, and really pretty much anywhere you can find me. I'm, I'm A.S. Elrod. Uh, and so would, would enjoy connecting with anyone there. 
Uh, and uh, you can also, uh, you know, my contact information is available at PulaskiInstitution.org. If you want to send an email, those uh, the, the contact there goes to me. Um, so uh, reach out if you'd like. I'd, I'd love to talk to people about this issue. I do care about it. And uh, thank you so much, Andrew, for having me on. I always enjoy having you. We'll have you back. The, this is one of those topics. It doesn't trend. It's not going to be big on Twitter or a big Facebook post. This stuff's yeah. important. It's really life important kind of stuff. And we would love to talk and highlight that. Good work, my friend. We'll talk again soon, sir. Thank you. Thank you. All the music on her tell is provided under a creative content license from monstercat.com. So when you need mealtime inspiration, it's worth shopping Kroger, where you'll find over 30,000 mouth-watering choices that excite your inner foodie. And no matter what tasty choice you make, you'll enjoy our everyday low prices, plus extra ways to save, like digital coupons worth over $600 each week. You can also save up to $1 off per gallon at the pump with fuel points. More savings and more inspiring flavors make shopping Kroger worth it every time. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Fuel restrictions apply. Every day, we rise, challenging ourselves to work for what we believe in. At U.S. Border Patrol, protecting our borders is more than a job. It's a calling. Agents answer the call, working together to keep our country and communities safe. If you are ready for a new mission, join U.S. Border Patrol and go beyond. Learn more at cbp.gov careers. Religion is at the intersection of our 21st century life, even if we don't express a faith. At a time when it seems that religion isn't as prevalent as it once was, it still leaves its mark everywhere. As a pastor, I know that religion isn't something I just do on a Sunday, but it's found in every nook and cranny of my life. Sexuality, politics, social media, the economy, war, nationalism, all have some kind of religious angle to them. And as a communicator, I want to find the stories that can help people understand this part of our society that is so important to so many. Hi, I'm Dennis Sanders, and I'm the host of Church and Main. Church and Main is a podcast about the journey of faith and where it intersects with modern life. I look at faith with a journalist's eye, asking the who, where, what, why, and how religion affects some of the major issues of the day. Join me as we journey together. You can listen to Church in Maine podcast at the website churchinmaine.org or on your favorite podcast app. I look forward to seeing you. Folks, you've heard of Ethan Brown on the Hurt Tell Show a couple of different times, but if you're interested in learning about how to discuss things like climate change without all the politics and doom and gloom, head over to his podcast, The Sweaty Penguin. Sweaty Penguin is a late-night comedy-style climate podcast working to add nuance, critical thinking, humor, and hope to the climate conversation. they got over 100 episodes already, breaking down weekly news stories and specific topics, from the vanilla to the ADHD to the international accountability to orangutans. Yes, I know, it's a comedy thing, so just go with it. But each time, exploring different ways we can make progress on these issues while still helping the economy, health, security, and everything else we care about. Feel overwhelmed, exhausted, or excluded by today's climate change discourse? This is the podcast for you. Find The Sweaty Penguin wherever you get your podcasts or at www.thesweatypenguin.com.